You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. To Happiness Ninja Down Under with your host, Jamie Rose. Jamie will educate and empower people, organizations, and communities to help us all make better health and well being choices. She will also engage you with expert influencers from around the world. So now, please welcome the host of Happiness Ninja Down Under, Jamie Rose. Hi guys, welcome back. This is the third episode of The Happiness Ninja. I am your host, Jamie Rose, and you're on Bold Brave Media coming to you live. We are in my apartment in New York, so I two weeks in a row I've stayed in the same place, uh, but don't get used to that because next week I'll be coming to you from a different state. I'll keep it a bit of a secret. <laughs> so... Today I have a, um, another guest for you. Um, I've known him on social media for quite a few years, but this is the first time that we're actually speaking face to face, so that's pretty excellent and exciting. So his name is Mike uh, Warsman, and he is the founder of uh, the organization called The Happiest. He has been a filmmaker and a producer. He is an avid traveler like myself. And he has also produced a film called A Million Smiles. And The Happiest is about to produce a new book and photo exhibition called None Other Than The Happiest. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. You're coming to us from Adelaide in Australia. Yeah, long, long way away. It's pretty early in the morning here. Yeah, it's uh, 7.30, did you say? 7 o'clock? 7.30, yeah. 7.30? Yep, it's the complete opposite here at 6 p.m. for me. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and getting up so early. I really, really appreciate it. No, uh, I'm uh, all, all too happy to, to be chatting with you. Very fond memories of New York coming back to me, um, spending a lot of time there on Wall Street and stuff, talking to people about happiness and how we, how we find it. When was the last time you were here? uh 2017 yeah 2017 i guess it feels like a while ago now but it was sort of three yep. times i i went to the us over the course of about three years um for this project and uh yeah but i guess no one's traveled much in the last couple of years so uh yeah <laughs> i've still been traveling interstate <laughs> yeah wow yeah, we, we, I, I was just in an event in Adelaide that uh, had 400 people in the same room and it sort of, it was crazy. It suddenly felt like everything was normal again here. Um, yeah. But we have been pretty lucky. Yeah. I felt the same way. Um, I was in North Carolina a few um, weeks ago and there was about 5,000 people at a free concert and I was like, yes, it feels normal. <laughs> Don't know how they were getting away with it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> May, may or may not have been legal. Who knows? Who knows? Exactly. <laughs> All right. So um, I wanted to get stuck into your story here. So where did it all begin for you? Is there, can you pinpoint a moment? I, I guess people always like to, to have some sort of moment. And I guess for me, I was asleep, um, sort of both literally and sort of metaphorically. I was actually on a plane. Um, going to South America from Australia, which is a, a really, really long way over the Pacific. Um, and I was, I was asleep and my best mate who was traveling with me just started like shaking me and said, wake up, wake up. I was like, oh, come on, man, this is no time for a joke. Like we'd always, you know, wake each other up and, and you know, play pranks on the other. And he's like, wake up, wake up, man. Like, always no, seriously, seriously. 
yeah yeah exactly it's, wake up wake up seriously dude seriously dude you need to wake up and i was like man i'm asleep piss off and he's like no man like he, and he really whispered quietly to not like startle everyone else he's like no seriously like the the plane the engine just blew up and i was like huh i was like what i was like bullshit just it's not a time to joke <laughs> like i went to sleep and and um yeah, I, I guess probably about a minute later after a lot of shaking and him really, really getting aggressive, I, I woke up and I looked to my to my left and um, there was just black and I was like, what, it's night time. And then suddenly bits of light started to come through that blackness out the window and you could wow. see that it was smoke gushing out of the engine. Um, Wasn't everyone and, screaming? Yeah, it was pretty terrible. <laughs> Well, not really. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, there may have been and I may have been asleep at that point. But, um, yeah, the, seeing those those bits of light coming through the smoke and, and, and the blackness of the smoke and um, then people were saying, you know, that there'd been yeah. fire and these sorts of things. And we're, you know, two hours out of Auckland over the Pacific and, and you can see the map still up on the screen in, in, in the plane. And, um, you know, the cabin staff were absolutely hysterical, which is sort of the opposite of what you'd <laughs> hope they would be. Yeah, um, you know there's the a problem pilots, then. <laughs> exactly. And the pilots are coming on speaking Spanish and, and my friend and I are looking around and there's this young 15-year-old girl sitting next to us who's just in absolute tears. Um, it was her first international trip. And, yeah, I, I think, like, sort of, you know, long story short, obviously, I survived. Um, but we were circling for two hours above the Pacific and and the, the stupid time. pilots didn't turn off the little screen. And so you could just see the plane sort of oh. going round and around, basically. And it was it, I, I think that something about that sort of really woke me up. Um, you know, we almost died. Like, I know that it's a pretty common thing. People say, oh, a near death experience or, or, you know, sort of wake you up to, to what life's about. Um, but for me, that was probably probably the straw that broke the camel's back so to speak so I, i'd been asking questions about sort of the nine to five life nice corporate job um this idea of success which really i, I felt like i'd achieved at that point point. And, um, and, and this is sort of, I'm, I'm 21 at this at this point um so you know but I'd, I'd graduated university got like a dream job as a journalist on tv um you know got another job in pr and, and was sort of like doing what i was meant to be doing um but you know, I mean, this this jolt of, of sort of like nearly dying um, was was sort of the first step. But then I actually uh, sort of travelled through South America eventually when we got there, and there was a lot of other chaos uh, along the way, to be honest, um, missed flights and these other things. Um, but I think it was sort of my first time really sort of going, okay, how do I insert myself in into this world in a more meaningful way? And starting uh, our, our tour in Peru. And, and seeing sort of the levels of poverty there. And, and I remember we were on this bike ride and, you know, there was these huts that were just built out of like scrap wood and metal that, that people could find. And something about like really, you know, continued to sort of slap me awake in a sense. And um, then we almost died three more times. Well, I almost died three more times. So in that we were journey? In, we were, yeah, in that same trip. Wow. So we were doing... <laughs> We were doing a, a, a hike to Machu Picchu. That was meant to be sort of the, the crescendo of our trip. It was, you know, um, and uh, the the day before we were doing that hike, there was a huge landslide and and uh, uh, many people died on the on the path that we were meant to be walking. So oh. sort of just skipped it there. Then there was that huge Santiago earthquake two days after we left. And then I was held at Knife Point actually in Rio during Carnival. Um, you know, wow. and uh, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, there, and there was a few other little bits and pieces where, you know, you never know, like one, one sort of, you know, move the, that way or that way. And um, I think it was just, it felt like, you know, um, you know, the powers that be sort of just tapping me on the shoulder and saying, hey, buddy, like, mm -hmm. there's something more that you're meant to be doing here. Um, and it was, it was hard. It was hard to choose and think that I that I needed to, to live a more responsible life, um, you know, and think more about others. But yeah, that that's sort of that's the moment, if if you will. So yeah. for someone so young, like at 21, being a male as well, no offense. <laughs> um, you don't. I mean, it doesn't surprise yeah. me that there was a significant reason behind it. 
um, because it's very unusual. Um, We're just about to cut for a break, but we'll come back to this um, when we get back. So, yeah, we'll be back in a moment, guys. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back, guys. We're on Happiness Ninja Down Under. I'm Jamie Rose, and we have Mike Warsman from Australia with us today. Welcome back, Mike. We've just um, come back from the break. And sorry, I had to interrupt your um, incredible story about your three, four near deaths in one journey. Uh, That is crazy. Um, But it led you down this path of happiness at a very, very young age, which very commendable. Um, did you find it difficult? Did your friends give you a bit of stick about it being such a young male, Australian male? I know what the culture's like in Australia. It's <laughs> very masculine. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was. I was always that sort of alpha male. I was, you know, very good at sport. I was, I was very naturally uh, good at, at academics as well, which was lucky. I uh, thank, thank my parents for that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I was – you know, getting paid to play football at the time. Um, you know, I was a journalist. I, I'd worked in PR, and yeah, it, it's sort of hard to to say to people. Uh, I'm I'm I think that there's something else that I'm I'm meant to be sort of doing in life, and to to sort of walk away um, in in the sense from what six. Um, and I, I had achieved success in in the way that people would see it. Um, and I was about to, so I, I, I was the youngest of all my friends to buy a house. I had a steady job. Um, and so in, in those couple of years after, uh, that near death experience or many experiences in South America, um, I actually, uh, decided to sell my house, uh, quit my job. And I, I started a news organization with uh, a guy who I'd actually studied at uni with. And we were both, we'd both been journalists. We'd both sort of been around that, that sort of media industry. And we were, I guess we were really concerned with the negativity of the, the news and, and the media and the impact that that was having on not only our happiness, but just our society in general. So the, the, the sort of example that we would often give when we would go and, and give talks um, was, you know, everything in this world had to be imagined before it could be created. So, you know, you're sitting on a seat and so am I. But someone had to actually go, OK, how do we create that seat? Like, how do I make the legs? How do I join them? How do I make a base? And I think the the same thing can be said for this better world that we'd all like to see, um, you know, really at the end of the day, if we can't imagine what peace and, you know, equality and 
a world without racism, without sexism actually looks like, because we're seeing it all the time. The news is just shining its bright spotlight on all of that terrible side of humanity all the time. Um, you know how can how can we ever achieve it? Because you can't imagine it if you're if you're watching the news every night. Um, so you know, yeah, my 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 now my best mate um, and I we decided to to start a news organisation that really followed the ethos that I was actually taught in journalism school at university, which was the job of a journalist is to reflect society back onto itself. So to hold a mirror up to society and say this is what's happening today. Um, but that's not what we were, what what we see on the on the news, obviously. So we were sort of people wanted to call us a good news organisation. We weren't really. We were just a balanced view. So we would look at the Afghan war, for instance, um, which was like really in its its full peak at that point. And you know, regular media would, for instance, say, you know, we've killed this many baddies and this many of us have been killed, and that's really what that would keep it at that simple. You know, we're killing you know these bad you know, Taliban people and this many of our soldiers have died and we're winning. And, you know, what what we wanted to do is say, well, OK, but why are we actually there? So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different theories about why why we went to war there. Certainly none of the 9-11 terrorists were actually from Afghanistan. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, sort of conjecture around, OK, well, if it's about getting girls and, and, and that society to have opportunities, then let's let's see what the soldiers are doing on the ground about that. And so, you know, we would interview uh, Australian, uh, you know, Marines and different people over there um, that were going and building schools whilst also protecting that that sort of area. So um, it was just sort of always, I guess, trying to find like the silver lining or Amy Winehouse was another example. You know, the media wanted to look at all of her excesses and her terrible choices, but actually she knew the difficult life that she'd had and and that's why you know when she died she she gave so much of her money to to charities that were were helping other people that had been through difficult situations like her so you know that's what we wanted to show is that there is always some sort of message or or some sort of uh, silver lining out of, of most stories in that, that we sort of see in the media um but that's not what we're confronted by most of the time so it was actually writing a story um, for that news organization that uh, I got into this whole happiness thing. So right. I was doing a story for Mental Health Week and I was interviewing a, a government minister. And there was a report that had just come out showing that loneliness had just become the number one cause of depression in the Western world. Mm -hmm. um, loneliness in a world of 7.3 billion, I think it was at that point. It's sort of like this strange um, sort of like what's going on? Like, why are, why are we not happy in Australia? I mean, you know, unlike the US, I guess, like we've got free health care, free education, free universities, um, you know, the, these great roads, great places, parks. Um, what else? What's missing? And, and so, you know, I guess I, 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 I started sort of my infatuation, if you will, with with happiness at that point and really just started to realize that, um, you know, this was where I wanted to spend my time. And, you know, on the weekends, I'm Mike, the football player and going <laughs> out. And I was actually I was actually coaching. I took up a role coaching football um, and got paid you know, money, I, I must be honest, um, which helped me fund um, the project that I was starting that news organization. Um, but so I'm out there, you know, with all my bravado and then I'm talking about <laughs> happiness and, and, and changing the news media during the week. And, um, you know, I, I probably put maybe $100,000, $150,000 in that, that first uh, couple of years of that organization just to, to get the, the cogs turning. And, um, yeah. you know, but, but do I regret anything? Absolutely not. Like, you know, um, it, it, uh, yeah, I guess there's there's got to be sacrifice to to chase happiness or to chase our purpose. Um, and and happiness for me okay. isn't isn't that sort of fleeting moment of joy. It's that that deep sense that would I change anything in my life right now? If your answer is no, you've reached your happiest state. But it, it'll change the next day, the next minute. So it's it, it's an ongoing challenge to try and you know it's not an end destination. There's you know there's got to be that journey. Oh, look, it's all about the journey. We know that 100%. Um, mm. We've just got to cut to another break, but uh, we'll, we'll be back in one second, uh, one moment, sorry, and we'll um, we'll continue digging deeper That's into your story, Mark. <laughs> what was that, sorry? 
That's a short ad break, one second. Yeah, one second, it's way too short. We'll be back in two minutes. <laughs> if you're a person caring for someone living with dementia, then this program is for you. It's designed for families and friends coping with the challenges of caregiving. The foundation of care, Susan Kohler believes, is communication. Innovative Dementia Care with Susan Kohler provides strategies to keep the lines of communication open between you and your loved one, increase quality interactions, decrease the burden of daily care for you, the caregiver. Join Susan, 11 a.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network. Susan and her guests will share techniques so you can facilitate your loved one's ability to safely follow your instructions, participate in daily activities, and express daily wants and desires. To learn positive solutions, creative ideas, and practical strategies that will build a healthy foundation of care. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live to Dare to Soar, Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network, and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Welcome back to Happiness Ninja Down Under. We're on the Bold Brave Media Network. We're coming to you live, and I am Jamie Rose, your host this evening. We are interviewing Mike Wasman from the organization called The Happiest. He's coming to us live from Adelaide in Australia. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you for joining us again. Yeah, always uh, good to be here. Looking forward to a uh getting into a bit more of the crazy, crazy part of my story. So, yes, you know. we, we just had to interrupt you there. So you were interviewing the minister um, about happiness. Um, were you happy yourself at the time? You'd only just sort of started on the journey. Did you have to do some research? Tell us a little bit more how that went. Yeah, look, um, I mean, at that point in, in time, I, I, I was absolutely within my dream that I was chasing. Um, I was probably working about 18 hours a day, um, but I was riding this absolute high of, of, you know, that comes with founding any sort of organization, I think. Um, but, you know, if I sort of rewind back to prior to, um, you know, that plane crash, uh, well, near plane crash, I should say. If I'd crashed, I guess I might not be talking to you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if I rewind a bit further, sort of in those tween years, um, you know, I was, I, I guess people would look at me and say, oh, privileged white male, um, you know, living out his dream. Um, but I don't think most people would choose my life. Um, you know, I think, and I think that's where the, the depth of my happiness comes from is actually suffering. And, and that's something that I guess within the research that I've done since um, has always been something. So how do we get out of that? Because there are a lot of people suffering. Um, my suffering began, you know, when I was 12 and I was sexually abused. Mm. Um, and, and that, I mean, that's not something I'm saying lightly, like it was over a, a fairly long period of time. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, you know, it, it was as bad as you can imagine. Mm. Um, but I guess the, the harder part as well was then my, my parents sort of ripped me out of where uh, I, I'd grown up, which was Adelaide. Um, and we went and lived up in, in, in Queensland in this really uh, sort of backward thinking town. Oh, um, where? Because that's you, my hometown. That my, my oh, home state. Yeah. Well, you, you probably know Pauline Hanson as, <laughs> as this very racist um, politician. And so I was living in a place where she was very popular. Um, and there was a lot of social issues in the town and a lot of my mates had started to take drugs, but I'd, I'd sort of seen that I didn't want to go down that path because my brother had, 
really started what was probably about three or four years into his now 25 year addiction. Um, okay. And so I'd seen the really active okay. side. And so, you know, yeah, yeah, great, great choice, to be <laughs> honest. Um, but, you know, he's he's in jail right now. So, um, yeah, again, probably shows that life hasn't been uh, always a, a bed of roses. But, he you know, I think that that's sort of... And you chose the other. That's the difference. Yeah, and, and that's and what people need to know. It's both, a choice. For sure. It's an absolute choice. He was as gifted academically in terms of sport, like those things that make life easy as a kid, right? Um, but, yeah, I guess... So then I'm, 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 you know, many years later, uh, sort of talking to to the minister and going, well, yeah, okay. So what started to change in my life? And and the first thing was just actually understanding who I was, so mm-hmm. that I was not necessarily, you know, the person that society wanted me to be. Like that wasn't actually who I was. I was trying to be something that I thought I was meant to be. And and because people always ask me, well, what's a recipe, Mike? How, how do we be happy? Um, you know, you've traveled to 70, 80 countries. You've interviewed, you know, prime ministers, uh, you know, experts around happiness research and, and all these different people. Um, you know, I, I think I've probably interviewed more people than anyone else around happiness. Um, like probably. I just walk around the streets, whether, it, whether it's in, um, you know, New York and, and talking to people on Wall Street, like that was one of the things that fascinated me. So, you know, you, you're asking about research and, um, you know, yes, I've read like just loads of books and articles and, and, and this area is always changing what we understand about the mind and chemicals and the body and, and um, you know, how, how we actually can potentially, you know, uh, become happier. Mm-hmm. But I think for me, the, the, the journey that I've been on since sort of deciding to, to sort of look at happiness as something that's really important was just to understand it on the deepest level myself. So, you know, I, 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 I guess I've done some strange things. Like I, I went to Afghanistan while the war was still in a, a pretty bad state. And what can we learn from the people there? Like what, you know, the, it, it, these hard questions, what can we learn from that situation from a war-torn country from people that have known war for 30 years you know what can we learn and and, and or, or what can we learn I, I went and lived in a Maasai village in the middle of nowhere with this sort of semi-nomadic tribe what can we learn from them because clearly a lot of what's happening in the US in Australia isn't leading to our happiest state mm-hmm. and so you know, again, what what can we learn maybe from the Scandinavian countries like Finland and Norway that always sort of lead the world in terms of happiness rankings? And, you know, again, what can we learn from the US? I, I spent a lot of time there, um, you know, researching happiness and, and going to, to, you know, I started in Salt Lake City, um, living with some Mormons. And, and what was I picking up from many different interviews with them about how they'd found some sort of happiness or, or what was making them unhappy. So I guess my, my research has been very experiential. Like, you know, it's been about living this crazy different life for 10 years. I've traveled to, to you know, about 70 or 80 countries. And like I say, I, I've interviewed heads of state and I've interviewed the homeless people, um, you know, on the streets. And because if you interview sort of that whole gamut, you, you learn, you're going to learn a lot more, right? You know, mm. we're, we're sort of told this idea of happiness that if I have enough stuff, um, you know, and if, if I have a, a wife and 2.4 kids and a nice dog and, and a big what house, that I, I will be happy. You know, it's, it's what we're told. It's very clearly what we're told to keep us consuming. Um, and, and the research have, is opposite. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think the, the greatest barrier to, to happiness in, in really the, the whole Western world is appreciation and gratitude. Um, and, and there's some fascinating sort of statistics and, 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 and research around that. There's, you know, a, a chimpanzee, um, there's this, this, oh no, it's a capuchin monkey, capuchin monkey. And so there's two in cages next to one another. And one is we might have to 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 uh, get to this after the break, but one one is uh, given a, a bit of cucumber, which it loves, and then its its partner is is eventually given a grape, which is much better in terms of what capuchin monkeys like. And you know, as soon as the one is tried to give uh, a, a bit of cucumber again, it throws a bit of cucumber back 
at the researcher and because it wants a grape because it's seen its buddy get a grape um so yeah it i think it's what about it hasn't so, got. exactly exactly yeah, and I, wants what the person living next door has exactly and i'd like to touch on that when we come back from the break um because i was thinking of that as you were talking about um the um the culture in australia and then what i've learned coming here so we'll, we'll get stuck into that we'll cut for the break now and we'll be back in That's two great. minutes Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of the Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back. I'm your host, Jamie Rose. You are on Happiness Ninja Down Under on the Bold Brave Media Network. We are live and we do have my special guest, Mike, from Australia. Mike, so just before the break, we had to cut uh, in the middle of your story. So you were telling us about an experiment. Um, just, just, do you want to just restart that a little bit? Yeah. So there, there's these two monkeys. Their their task is to give a, a researcher gives them a rock, um, and they give the the rock back to the researcher, and they're given a piece of cucumber, which is great. Which is like I love cucumber. Um, I, I gather that uh, you may also like cucumber. Um, in monkey world, a cucumber is a pretty good thing. Um, so the, the monkey that's given the cucumber is really happy to begin with. Um, then the monkey in the cage next door, and you can they can see one another, these two monkeys. The monkey in the cage next door, given the rock, gives the rock back to the researcher and is given a grape. And grapes are kind of like chocolate in monkey world. Um, so it, it's, it's really a much better treat. And sort of then, then the, the rock is passed to that monkey number one and uh he gives the rock back and he's given another piece of cucumber and he's sort of like sketching out like wait but that guy got the gray um i've got the cucumber i'm not really happy he, he starts to take a bite and then he's like nah and throws it at the at the researcher and then the other monkey is given the the rock again gives it back given another grape and this this monkey, by the end of it, this first monkey who's given the cucumber, just goes literally bananas. And pardon the pun. Um, and so, it, Dad you know, it, it's pretty simple. It's really pretty, pretty Yeah. Well, I'm about to be a father. So I know. It makes sense. Um, but uh, I'm just training, training. Um, yeah. So, it, and it's pretty similar for humans. Like, you know, we we it, it, you are better in terms of happiness having the best house on the worst street. Because if you've got the poorest house on the best street and all of your neighbours are wealthier than you, you're going to feel like ungrateful, right? You're going to feel like, you know, what? why don't I have everything that they have? Why don't I have a swimming pool or a tennis court? 
Um, so, you know, it, it's very difficult to, to say to someone, um, you know, want less. And I don't think it's necessarily about wanting less. It's about saying, what do I have and what am I grateful for? And, and I think the biggest part of that is, is perspective. So, you know, you and I have traveled and we've seen, you know, I've, I've seen in Lima those, those shanty huts and I've been to Afghanistan during the war and seen what, it, yeah. you know, uh, uh, what that means for those people and, and, and the terrible sadness that, that often exists in those places. And I can then sit here in Australia and go, oh, man, I'm lucky. Yeah. Like, you know, like, and how lucky. And so, therefore, I can I can try and go out and live that crazy life that I've been living where, you know, every day I, I feel alive because I'm connecting with people. I'm chasing um, my dream, which is, is to really just get more people chasing their own dream um, or chasing their own version of happiness. Um, you know, because we're all different as well. And that's the beauty of humanity is, is your, your path to happiness is not the same as mine. And it's no. not the same as any of your viewers out there. Yeah, I think you like you've made a really good point in terms of um, we we need to focus on what makes ourselves happy, but we need to be aware that what we are indoctrinated with on a, and pushed on a daily basis to think will provide us happiness won't. And then to be aware of what actually will provide us happiness, that's where the key is. Because all this stuff that people are telling us we need to be happy, it's basically the complete opposite. Um, you were touching on um, money before. The research shows that if you earn about fifty to seventy thousand a year, you're no more, and you're, like all your basic needs are met. You're, you you can go out, and you can have fun. You don't have to really stress massively. Um, yeah. That you're no happier than a billionaire or a millionaire, someone no. with a shit ton of money, because they still have just as much negative emotions on a daily basis as everybody else as a poor person because a poor person's actually struggling to survive and has less time to think about how miserable they are. Yeah. Well, exactly. And there's a lot of research. Millionaires, billionaires have some of the greatest uh, levels of depression in society. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that probably comes, I, I remember this, uh, the Maasai, one of the Maasai chiefs that I, I was interviewing and, you know, he said, you know, in order to get to that point of, of, of you know, being on top and having all this money, um, you know, you've squashed and you've pushed everyone away so that you can pursue that goal. And, you know, he sort of would laugh that, you know, we, we, we do that. Whereas, you know, they're living in this, this small village um, where the only thing between them and these great big lions and hyenas and these sorts of things are, are a few prickly bushes. Um, and when we were, were living in, in these um, traditional cow dung huts in the village, um, you know, you did learn a hell of a lot about happiness because uh, they live together. And, and, you know, during the day, the women would do those beautiful beads that people have probably seen, mm. you know, massive people wearing. And they would spend hours and just talking together. And then the men would go out and, and be making spears and various different things um, to help with their cattle herding and um, protection of the village. But, yeah, I, I think it's just... We, we've sort of just bought into to sort of this Kardashian happiness or, or, or this sort of um, this thing that Hollywood's often selling us um, that is, you know, more is more. And we I think we all know that that's not the case and that we're all feeling this sort of emptiness within our lives because of this destruction of community that comes with, mm -hmm. um, you know, so. You know, for instance, I'm, I'm about to have a kid. I, I think you know that. And, yes. <laughs> um, you know, so my wife and I, we, we sort of talk um, about, well, you know, yes, it shouldn't be that, that the mum has to stay home or, or, or um, you know, and the father goes to work. Um, but it is really important for one of us to make that sacrifice to make sure our, our baby, you know, has, has love and has a sense of connection to, to the parents, um, you know, and so... Yeah, I, I think it's just hard. We're sort of, there's a lot of statistics down here saying that, you know, women, most women are having, well, there's a growing proportion of women having caesareans at 37 weeks because that's easy and that's that's sort of helpful for your career and you can get back in. And are we really that willing to, to prioritise the making of money? And, and what are we making it for? Like you make all this money so that you can, um, you know, at work, you're spending 10 hours a day at work so that you can come home to a family that, 
you know you never get to see in a nice house that you never get to spend time with and you know your your nice car you you drive for 10 minutes to and from work um is that right i don't know that that's right like I, i've seen enough other examples of how to live to to sort of you know raise some eyebrows and and go that's broken that's a broken system yeah. and i think we all know it um but it's about how do you alter your life within all of this like we have you know these systems built that you know, really structured around that that consumerist sort of culture. So it's I it's very difficult. But totally agree. We just have to cut um, for another break. But yeah, let's continue that when we come back because, um, like you said, everybody does know it, but they're just looking for an easy answer because they think that that will come, but it won't. So we'll be back in a moment and we'll continue. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Hi guys and welcome back to Happiness Ninja Down Under. I'm Jamie Rose and you're on the All Brave TV Network coming to you live from New York City uh, and Australia. My guest Mike is here with me, founder of The Happiest. He's a filmmaker and a author and a soon to be father. Uh, so before the break, we were just um, touching on the fact that we both agree that most people seem to know that the uh, the easy way is not going to lead to happiness, but yet people seem compelled to still chase this. Uh, this ra it's a rat race. There's literally a, a documentary on chasing the rat real rat r race wheel of happiness. Um, so before we go back to you, Mike, I just wanted to open um, the line up to callers. They can call in live. If you're in the US, um, it's 1-866-451-1451. Or if you're overseas, just throw a plus um, on the front, plus one, 866-451-1451. So if you'd like to, um, to call in with your thoughts, Maybe you're somebody who is really resistant to um, to doing the things they know is actually going to make them happy. Maybe you're stuck in that identity um, where depression has just taken over your identity and you can't move past it. Um, but yeah, I'd like to open up the line and invite callers to have a chat. Um, what, what's your thoughts on that, Mike? Do you, like, are you finding that people are still doing that in your life? Because that's <laughs> what I'm experiencing. <laughs> Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I think it has distanced me the more, the further sort of down this road I, I've traveled. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I've made new friends. 
Um, but there is sort of this, oh, why is Mike doing that? Why is he living that sort of life? And I'm, I'm not living that different to life. And I think it's always been one of the things that I've seen as lucky um, in terms of pursuing this and being able to be sort of a public figure in, in this space is I still have quite a normal life. Like I live in a nice apartment. I have quite nice furniture. I don't live in a big house because I, I don't think that that's sustainable. And, and also um, I don't want to spend all my money on, on where I live. Um, I prefer to spend it on experiences. Um, but, you know, certainly I, I, I you know, I ha I'm lucky. I, I'm a filmmaker. I make, you know, a, a, a reasonable wage in a very short period, which allows me to, um, you know, pursue this, this project called The Happiness. The happiest, sorry, don't even know my own organisation. Um, but, you know, but even my paid work is really in line with this. So I, I work, you know, as a filmmaker for a lot of different charities. So I've travelled to, you know, in terms of my paid stuff, um, to the largest refugee camp on earth, all through Africa, all through Asia. And, and, and looking at, you know, again, um, you know, how can we live a, a better or a happier existence? Um, and, and what is the role of, say, NGOs in that? Um, what is the role of government in that? And, you know, I, I guess, you know, people always say, you know, especially probably in places like the US that are very sort of the government can't tell me what to do. Yeah, but governments can actually set up systems and structures that we know are going to be uh, allow us to be happier people. And so, you know, and like I, I, not I doing that right now. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I interviewed the Prime Minister of Iceland, and Iceland is really always in the top five happiest countries mm -hmm. on earth. And, you know, she was this beautiful, beautiful person with, you know, I think the biggest thing for me, um, and I've interviewed a lot of different politicians, but she was very free of ego. I'll be honest, like for a, for a Prime Minister, um, you know, you, 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 you're someone that normally we would associate with no, I know, right, I'm going to tell you what to do, um, or or that they just will shut their ears and won't mm -hmm. listen to anyone. Um, but, you know, you go into her office and, you know, she just comes out, hi, I'm Katrin, and, you know, and not I'm the Prime Minister or, or there wasn't someone. She just came out and felt like talking to my mum almost. Um, and, you know, what had she studied? You know, she, she, she'd done her Master's in Icelandic crime fiction, so, like, you know, she's not someone that's studied law or engineering or one of these, these um, you know, normal careers that we associate with politicians. And mm. so, you know, why is Iceland happier? Because, you know, they're, they're led by people that just care about society. She said the greatest, um, you know, yeah. gift that she has that can help her govern is that she's a mother. And yeah. so if, if, if she, you know, wants to look after her kids, that will help her look after all kids. You know, so she wants to do what's right by her kids. And, you know, but I guess the the thing that we get trapped into thinking is I'm just going to help my kids and mm -hmm. to hell with everyone else. And that's sort of, I guess, what we see creeping in a little bit in Australia under the current government. And certainly you see it a lot in, in the US, um, you know, is this idea of capitalism, really, uh, which is that, you know, it's all about sort of me looking after myself and that the government shouldn't have a role in society much. Um, it, it, you know, every, the, the uh, um, Declaration of Independence in America sort of says, you know, um, that they're all born equal, but that's just not true. We're not all born equal. Uh, it's a nice idea to think that we are, but, you know, my nephew who's got very severe autism, he can't live the same life that I can mm. or you can live. Like, um, but can the government help to make sure that he can live his best life Absolutely. And here in Australia, you know, he's given hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, um, you know, so he can go to school so that he can get, you know, whatever medication or help, um, you know, my parents look after him and um, they can get some support. Um, people would say, oh, but then why taxpayer money? And it's like, well, that's to help make sure that like I'm I, I, I was born with all the privilege in the world. And he's born with this really difficult um, condition to make and just to, just to try and bring him up a little bit. And, you know, without that, um, he would have a, a, a much worse life. Um, so or, or, or here, you know, there's there's people with these really rare conditions and, you know, there's a medication that costs two hundred and sixty thousand dollars. And, you know, in, in America, you'd need to have private health cover to, to access that or you'll just die. Whereas in Australia, they've just put it under the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, which brings that $260,000 medication down mm. to being about $30.
and and that's that's what a, that's what happiness looks like. That's what equality, you know, is is a result of. And Iceland actually, um, why is it, it's got the 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 most equal uh, sort of happiness um, across the whole of the society. And why? Because it has the most equal wages. Mm. So yeah, you know, and most of the Scandinavian companies. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. No, there's, 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 there's no one perfect way, but um, yeah, there's definitely some countries are doing things a lot better than others. That's for sure. And but, why not just copy them? Why are governments not copying that system? That's my big question. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no easy answer for that. Um, I know that I could carry on about my personal views on that for hours and hours, but I'd probably get very fired up and probably piss a lot of people off. <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll cut to the last break. And um, when we come back, I would like you to tell the audience about your book and photo exhibition and um, enlighten us on that, if you don't mind. Sounds great. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll be back soon, guys, in uh, two minutes. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of current and concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations, Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back, guys. Uh, we've nearly finished uh, the episode for today, but uh, you are back on Happiness Ninja Down Under, and I'm Jamie Rose. And uh, I just wanted to touch on um, Mike's book, The Happiest. It is due to come out soon. Um, if you would like to take us through that, Mike, could you tell us all about that, please? Yeah, so I guess it's a really in-depth look at what we've been talking about today. So, you know, it, it, it goes, you know, right from looking at, you know, examples and people that I've met all across the world that exemplify the different qualities that can, you know, lead to a happier life. Um, so it's called the happiest people, places and ideas on earth. And that's really essentially what it talks about. I mean, and I guess, you know, it's built around my life and, and, and the journey that I've been on and how integrated how I've found happiness, I guess, through this journey. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, you've got, you know, a bakery security guard in Sri Lanka being, you know, one of the, the most famous sort of videos that, that I've made. Um, and why, how is he happy? You know, it's because he's understood who he is. And in that tiny little job where he's, you know, just greeting people at a bakery, He's made himself a life that, that you know, spreads happiness amongst his community. Um, then, you know, you've got, you know, an interview with the Dalai Lama. Um, you know, so how can we sort of, you know, find happiness within whatever religion you follow? So there's interviews, you know, with religious leaders from, you know, Hindu background, Islam, Christianity, mm -hmm. Judaism, you know, and various other smaller religions. Um, you know, it, it, it covers... 
you know, things like giving. Like, you know, we all know that giving makes us, you know, absolutely joyous and, and happy. Um, but what's getting in the way? Why are we not all doing that more often? Whether it's money. I mean, people always think, oh, I've got to give money. But no, give time or give your love. Um, you know, to, to something and, and you'll be happier like you will. That's what all the science tells us. It's what we all know intuitively. Um, but there's just so many distractions these days. And, and again, those distractions. So I, I, there's, you know, I guess social media and, and the way of like this modernization of the world is one of the themes that's sort of throughout the book. Um, and another thing is looking at our human evolution, you know, because if we can understand where we've come from and, and where we have found happiness or some sort of ability to, to sort of be content for thousands of years, um, maybe that's where we need to look to, to sort of get back to, um, you know, David Attenborough in his, his most recent uh, documentary says, yeah, we do need to like, sort of look at our look at our past in order to um you know create a, a better um situation for ourselves now and I, i'm a big believer in that um you know it, it's only very recently that humans started to have a lot of the problems that we're seeing that are leading to anxiety and depression um you exactly. know where we all have to have more we're on this hedonic treadmill they call it um yeah. where in humorism you know, I, I, exactly i but the hedonic treadmill idea is a good one for people to know i mean once you get more, once you get that job promotion and, and you're the director of your company, you'll still want more. If you've if you've been that person that's wanted more, there'll still always be more. There'll always be someone richer than you. There'll always be Elon Musk. Yeah, he's really wealthy, but there's still people richer than him. And so he probably still wants to get, you know, more. I mean, he's maybe not a great example because he's he's also doing some interesting things in the world, but you know, there will always be someone with more. And so yeah. if we start down that path, you're not going to win. It's it's a it's a lose lose. Um, but the book, yeah, I mean, look, the book looks at all these different perspectives. And that's the final chapter of the book is about perspective. Um, you know, it's about looking at, you know, what I've learned from the sex slave I interview in Cambodia. Um, mm. And then it looks at what I what I learn, you know, when I talk to a member of the Taliban, um, who is the most inspiring guy, you know, that I've ever met. And, you know, it's, he's not a typical member of the Taliban, I must say. Um, but that's sort of the, the curious different characters that, are, that I, I, I have within the book. Um, so you have so interviews yeah, it, and, and um, the photos along with these people all around the world. Yeah. And, and world-leading research. So, like, yeah, you know, the likes of Jeffrey Sachs, who, who you know, writes the World Happiness Report. Um, you know, all these people, scientists, um, you know, right, right across the globe. Um, you know, because, it, it, yeah, I guess you've got to marry all of that up so that you can find, I guess, your happiest state, which is, um, yeah, something that I certainly feel like I've been privileged enough to, to find. And, yeah, it changes every day. I might have a terrible day once I get off this uh, you know, this interview, or I might have a great day, but you know, every day is new and we can always start again, um, with a yeah, clean slate. hundred percent. Um, and I know I like, so you're, uh, we have to, um, end here, but I have ordered your book pre-order. It is available for pre-order now. Uh, if you go to thehappiest.com, it's right there, smack up the top, you know what you're doing. Um, it's, I can't wait for this book, especially now that you've told me about uh, some of the people that you've interviewed in it. Um, so I'm, I am sorry we are out of time there today, but thank you so much um, for getting up nice and early and joining <laughs> me here um, and, and sharing your story with, um, with the world. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, Jamie. No, thanks for having me. And I look forward to uh, getting back to New York when, when borders open up and hopefully we can catch up in person. I would love that. Thank you. Thanks all for joining us, guys. Uh, this has been Jamie Rose on the Happiness Ninja Down Under and the Bold Brave TV Network. This has been Happiness Ninja Down Under with your host, Jamie Rose. Tune in each week and join in the conversation as Jamie highlights the true power of the human mind to create a thriving world. Right here on Jamie Rose's Happiness Ninja Down Under. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.